Hey guys, a very good morning. I hope all of you are doing great. Yes, uh, in this time, um, I hope that all of you are keeping yourselves at home and uh, all of you are doing great and uh, you're taking care of yourself. Uh, stay uh, at home and uh, keep yourself um, healthy and uh, make sure that you, um, you know, sanitize everything that uh, you get from online or you're buying it from the outside. Yeah. So just continue to take care of yourself. You're looking forward to seeing you guys again in college. Uh, we, we miss uh, being there in college. And uh, yeah, I hope uh, uh, we, that will uh, happen soon. And uh, all these uh, bad days will, you know, are going to uh, soon come to an end. Yeah. And uh, yeah, for today's lecture, today we, uh, I'd like to discuss about the applied anatomy. Uh, in relation to a complete denture uh, patient for the maxilla and uh, the mandible and uh, by the end of the lecture I would like for you guys to know what are the terms about uh, in uh, complete denture fabrication then what are the consequences of edentulousness then uh, I also will uh, briefly describe the clinical uh, steps that are involved in um, fabrication of a complete denture. Then uh, I will also speak about the anatomy of denture bearing areas in the maxilla and the mandible and uh, and also discuss about the stress bearing areas, relief areas, then the supporting structures and the limiting structures. And I hope by the end of the class, all these uh, uh, topics will be cl uh, clear for you. Yeah. So to define a complete denture processes is that replaces all of your natural dentition and it is associated with structures of the maxillae and the mandible and it may be supported by mucosa or sometimes by dental implants. So uh, the one which is supported by dental implants is usually an implant supported uh, uh, processes or it can be a hybrid denture or it can be a a fixed removable denture which is supported by implants that will be discussed uh, in detail uh, later uh, but now uh, in our lecture we will be looking at the anatomy and uh, how uh, the state of edentulousness affects uh, the patient's uh, quality of life and things like that yeah so what are the objectives of doing a complete denture processes so when you see a patient uh, who is completely edentulous walks into your OPD and uh, this patient is uh, supposed to be dealt by you. So when at the end of the fabrication of your processes, your uh, complete denture should provide aesthetics, definitely, then improve mastication, then improve speech and also enhance the function without any interferences, then preserve the uh, uh, remaining oral structures uh, main, and also help in maintenance of health and comfort. So what are the consequences of edentulousness? So you know that in a, in a partially edentulous patient or if you look at a person in your OPD, a person who has, uh, you know, undergone extraction for one particular teeth. You see, there are uh, a lot of changes that happen in that edential site. So if, if that is the case for one single tooth, how about a patient who has lost all his teeth? He's completely edentulous. Yeah. So there are a lot of things that that particular patient uh, will be going through. I would rather say that uh, such kind of patients are called as dental cripples because they do not have the ability to, uh, you know, function like a normal individual. Yes, the quality of life is also compromised. Some of the main consequences that you will be coming up uh, across in completely edentulous patients are uh, like uh, the they have the compromised ability to, to chew food then the there is an alteration in food uh, selection and preparation so their overall reduction in dietary uh, intake uh, then their nutritional status is affected and so as the nutrition is affected so is the general health then um, 
there are also alterations in certain uh, perceptual and sensory sensory measures then um, alterations in the taste and textures uh, preferences then um, like then there is a uh, also a uh, financial burden for the treatment you know uh, if they're going for a better treatment uh, like something like a, a fixed fixed uh, treatment then uh, then the tongue increases in size and decreases the denture stability and overall also you notice that the neuromuscular control of the jaw decreases especially when it is an elderly person uh, the neuromuscular control is completely lost so these are some of the some of the consequences that you see so these are the things that you need to keep in mind when you are going to fabricate a processes so that your processes or your final denture should be able to meet at least some or most of the needs of the so the steps in fabrication of a complete denture processes there are mainly five appointments that you will have to uh, speak about to your patient and to be on the safer side and since you guys are still in your learning phase you can always uh, add one more appointment to cross check and cross verify uh, if there are any uh, uh, mistakes on your side or if there are any laboratory uh, errors so you can always say that uh, it might take up to six appointments yeah so when your patient walks into the OPD the first appointment will always be your primary impression your primary impression is is made with either alginate or um, impression compound or it also can be made with a elastomeric uh, impression material so you should before making your primary uh, impression you should ensure that all the soft tissues are uh, completely healed uh, from the time of extraction to the time of your first impression there should be at least a, a gap of at least three to four weeks so that the soft tissue is completely healed and there's no debris or any food accumulation locally near the extraction socket and next comes your second step that is your secondary impression border molding and secondary impression so once your primary impression has been made you make a primary cast and uh, once your primary cast has been made on that we fabricate a special tray or a custom tray that tray can be used only for that particular patient uh, that will also be given as a demo and it will be explained to you in detail um, so once you make your special tray you do this process called as border molding yeah you record all the tissue borders uh, with the functional moments of the mandible and the maxillae and once the uh, tissue moments have been recorded you make a secondary or the final impression with either zinc oxide eugenol material or a light body material or a medium body material so based on the condition of that patient or the type of soft tissue coverage you decide on which kind of material has to be used because sometimes the patients can be allergic to uh, eugenol they can be hypersensitive so you cannot use zinc oxide eugenol you would have definitely observed your students uh, your your senior students uh, who were practicing complete denture cases right so if they have an allergy towards zinc oxide eugenol so in those cases then you might have to use a elastomeric impression material so it it uh, solely depends on the clinician's choice as to which material can be used uh, to make the final impression so once your final impression has been obtained then you make a master cast so your secondary impression uh, has to be uh, prepared that, uh, that that includes beading and boxing of the impression and preparation of the master cast so once you uh, have the master cast in your hand as you see in picture uh, in step number three so you will fabricate denture bases acrylic denture bases so uh, with the help of soft uh, soft or self cure acrylic or light cure uh, acrylic material that is auto polymerizing resin you make a denture base and on the denture base you prepare uh, wax occlusal rims with the ideal height that might be adjusted in the patient mouth so once the jaw relation once the occlusal rims have been fabricated the the step would be your 
uh, vertical jaw relations and your uh, centric relation records. So you determine the vertical uh, jaw, uh, jaw relations and then you guide the patient into his or her centric and you record the centric relation position of the uh, patient. So in each step what would be done and how you would determine the uh, facial height all of these will be explained to you in a demonstration clearly and next moving to the step 4 that is once you have determined the facial height and your uh, centric record is secured you will seal those cars that is your maxillary and your mandibular cars and this will be mounted on a articulator so once you have mounted on the articulator with the help of the midline that is marked on the occlusal rim you will begin your teeth arrangement so you will arrange the teeth as you have done in your preclinical prosthodontics an ideal teeth arrangement you will do the teeth arrangement and then in your fourth stage in the clinic clinicals you will be doing something called as the denture trial so it's a trial denture your trial denture should look as good as that of your final denture because that is the one which determines the success of the final processes the patient must be satisfied with aesthetics phonetics the appearance and different other criteria that has to be checked the occlusion all of these things have to be checked in stage 4 before the fabrication of the final processes so once the patient has given his or her consent and uh, that he or she is satisfied with the trial denture that is when you will proceed to the fabrication of the final processes that involves acrylization procedures so just as you have done in your preclinical uh, preclinical process uh, fabrication of your ideal complete dentures so let's have a look at uh, uh, what are the anatomical landmarks on the mandible and the maxillae uh, separately yeah so there's something called this limiting structures and supporting structures so uh, to define limiting structures are uh, those areas or those sites that will guide us in having an optimum extension of the denture so as to engage the maximum surface area without uh, interfering with the normal uh, muscle function or muscle action so when you are extending your denture upon these areas these limiting areas these structures will not uh, uh, interfere or will not lead to dislodgement of the denture or neither they will not cause any soreness on the soft tissue area so what are these structures that your it's your labial frenum labial vestibule buccal frenum buccal vestibule hamular notch and posterior palatal seal there's something called as supporting structures as well so so supporting structures are the ones which are like uh, that the parts of the maxillae or the mandible that will provide the maximum area to support your processes so it provides the primary support for your denture that is uh, the they, they are again uh, subcategorized as primary stress bearing areas and secondary stress bearing areas in your primary stress bearing areas it is the hard palate then uh, posterior uh, posterolateral slopes of the residual alveolar ridge and your secondary stress bearing areas are the rugae and the maxillary tuberosity areas Apart from your limiting structures and your supporting structures, there are some areas of the uh, residual ridge that you will have to give a relief. That is where, where your relief wax will be or the spacer wax will be going. That will again be discussed later. Yeah. So it is your incisive papilla, your cuspid eminence, mid palatine raphe and fovea palatina. So this is a picture in this slide you see that uh, there is the residual ridge of the maxilla and the mandible. So this as you notice that it's is a the bone or the residual ridge is the the remaining bone is the supporting structure or the foundation for your complete denture processes. 
please observe the maxillae and the mandible. So as you see and notice, you can see that uh, the extraction sites are completely healed or well healed and there are no sockets that are being exposed. So this uh, shows that uh, the fabrication of the complete denture processes can be done only after complete healing because during the first one year uh, of the extraction, or, uh, or, or uh, during the first six months, there is more rapid resorption uh, of your uh, residual ridge. That is what you need to take into consideration before you're giving a processes. Because if you are unable to, uh, you know, make sure that you are not giving too much of uh, occlusal load or force on the maxilla or the mandible, what happens is this might lead to further uh, resorption of that particular area. Yeah. So that's what you need to look at. So if you look at this particular picture, yeah, this these are the areas that you will have to first be well versed with, right? So this is your incisor papillae. This is your residual ridge. Then this is where your rugae will come. And this is where your labial frenum is there. Then this area is called as your labial vestibule. Then this is your mid palatine raphae. Here you have your buccal frenum and buccal vestibule in this particular area. Then this is your uh, uh, tuberosity area and uh, this is your hard palate area. And at the junction of your hard palate and the soft palate over here is the uh, PPS area or the posterior palatal seal area and at the junction of the PPS area there are small minute depressions which are called as the fovea palatinae right and behind the tuberosity area is your pterygomandibular raphe. So I hope this is a, uh, giving you a clear picture of what are the different um, areas of the maxillae. We will discuss in detail about each particular part. So first considering the labial frenum. So when you observe a completely edentulous patient, so this is what you're going to look at. This is your labial frenum. So why is this labial frenum? I will not be looking at the notes over here. I hope you will be able to go through it, but I will just describe and discuss about the clinical implications about uh, every uh, supporting and limiting structures. So how is this labial frenum important for you? So when you fabricate a complete denture processes, this particular area has to be relieved. Yeah, it's a band of soft tissue. So what happens if you don't make a relief in this particular area on your complete denture processes? Every time this labial frenum will be in the functional moment what happens is it dislodges the denture so that is why there should be a relief that is given in this particular area and next coming to your labial vestibule so in this area around the uh, residual ridge you see that this is your labial vestibule so this labial vestibule it determines and you decide what is the thickness of your labial flange that is of your complete denture, how thick your denture should be in that particular area. So this labial vestibule, they have mainly three objectives. One is it should provide sufficient support to the upper lip. It should uh, uh, help in uh, reflecting the mucous membrane. And at the same time, it should not interfere with your lip function because as you notice in this particular area, it is your upper lip that is present and should not interfere with the uh, upper lip movement. And if there is too much of thickness of the labial flange also, what happens is it gives you a monkey face uh, uh, appearance that you will have to look at which might compromise on the aesthetics. So next is coming your buccal Frenum. So your buccal frenum is mainly associated with these three muscles, your buccinator, orbicularis oris and levator angular oris. So these areas also just like your labial frenum have to be relieved so that they do not interfere with the denture functioning. So if this area is not relieved, what happens is when the patient begins to move his jaw 
or he begins to speak the denture will slowly dislodge from this area and the denture will keep falling so when so you have to remember that if your patient has come back to you saying that when i uh, when i place the denture denture is returned to but when i open my mouth and begin to speak something the denture keeps falling and they will tend to point out towards this particular area and say that the denture is first dislodging from this area so then you will have to see whether of the buccal frenum has been removed yeah next coming to your buccal vestibule so buccal vestibule uh, in that area also it decides the thickness of the, den the distal end of the buccal flange okay the buccal vestibule it extends from this particular this buc buccal frenum area posteriorly towards the hamular notch okay and this is influenced by your buccinator and modiolus muscle and distally by the coronoid process so in this particular step how do you record this buccal vestibule is that once you place your uh, uh, custom tray in the patient mouth uh, you need to ask the patient to open and close his or her mouth so that the coronoid process of the mandible comes in contact with the hamular notch in this particular region and it it molds the green stick compound and records the thickness of the distal end in this buccal flange area next coming to your hamular notch so this is your in this particular area behind the tuberosity is your hamular notch okay it is just around 2 mm wide and this particular area also should be recorded when you're making your uh, border mold next coming to your posterior palatal seal area so posterior palatal seal area is the most important uh, uh, landmark for you and it is supposed to be uh, the most important uh, step which helps in the retention of your complete denture processes it helps in maintaining a seal of your complete denture and it prevents the uh, passage of air or food between the uh, under surface of the denture and the soft tissue so there is something called as valsalva maneuver which we ask the patient to uh, close his nose and uh, ask him to blend uh, to uh, to just blow through the nose uh, with a vigorous uh, uh, action like saying ha yeah so by saying this what happens is there is a there there is the movement or that is observed at the junction of the hard and soft palate that demarcates or that signifies that that is where your posterior palatal seal area is and that area should uh, should be marked and the same has to be recorded in your final impression uh, uh, final impression because that is the posterior most uh, uh, area of your denture and that decides still where the denture has to be extended yeah so in this picture can you make out that this your posterior vib uh, vibrating line or the posterior palatal seal area this is how in this yellow color it is marked very clearly and this is following the hamular notch area behind uh, on the right side completely extending like this towards your left side next coming to your ruge area so usually ruge area they uh, help in the uh, uh, like uh, the the uh, uh, phonetics because your tongue when it comes in contact with the ruge in the palate area there are certain consonants so certain sounds that are produced here yeah? so these area or uh, these areas must be also fabricated in your uh, complete uh, denture and also it resists the anterior displacement so these small rough areas where the denture is going to engage it will prevent the anterior displacement of your complete denture next uh, coming to your maxillary tuberosity area is, is, this is an important denture support area it also provides a resistance in the horizontal uh, movement so when the patient so you need to understand that when you are chewing food it's just not your open and closed movements but the patient tends to move his jaw i mean all of us uh, have lateral movements that is your right lateral and your left lateral so is your complete denture patient also susceptible to such kind of movements okay so when the patient is moving to the right or left the maxillary tuberosity area is of much importance next coming to your incisive papilla 
so incisor papillae as you can notice uh, also is uh, a fibrous connective tissue and it has to be uh, relieved in this area that is by the help of a spacer and next below the incisor papillae is required is your incisor foramen so in your uh, painted cards you can see that this area is your incisor papillae area next coming to your fovea palatine as i mentioned earlier these are two small pits or depressions in the posterior aspect and it also helps in um, uh, acting as a guide for posterior border of the dent next your mid palatine raphe it's a uh, uh, rather it, it's something to do with uh, an elevation in the center of the hard palate that extends from the incisor papillae and posteriorly over the entire hard palate over the entire the length of the uh, hard palate and under the mid palate and raphe is your mid palate and suture that is so your right maxillae and your left maxillae they are both communicated with the mid palate and uh, uh, suture and this is covered with a small submucosa which is non resilient and denture tends to rock if this area is not relieved so if you have not relieved this particular area what happens is when the patient is by uh, is chewing the denture uh, tends to rock to the right or to the left next coming to torus palatinus area it's a bony enlargement or a bony uh, projection like thing that is present in the palate palate area it is not seen in all the patients but in some kind uh, some patients it is uh, uh, it is very dominantly uh, observed and then coming to your uh, coronoid bulge and then uh, looking at uh, coronoid bulge so uh, as you see that this blue uh, area uh, behind this blue area is this orange area so this is where your coronoid bulge is so uh, this area is uh, important because if this the depth of this area and uh, also the thickness of the flange if it is not properly uh, done during border molding what happens is when the patient opens his mouth wide or open and close movement when this uh, particular uh, 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 movement is done what happens is the denture tends to dislodge only in this area so anteriorly the denture might be very retentive but uh, posteriorly you will see that the denture will keep uh, dislodging so the width of this uh, area uh, has to be uh, recorded the width of this dis uh, the distal buccal flange in that area determines the coronoid bulge so for an ideal uh, maxillary ridge uh, these are the things that you need to have an abundant keratinized tissue then the arch shape should be like a square arch shape then the palate should be a u shaped palate uh, there should be a moderate palatal vault then there should not be any undercuts uh, or uh, high frenal attachments or uh, and also you should have a very well defined hamular notches that is only seen in a moderate or very low resorption patterns but if there is high resorption that is seen in the maxillae what happens is the hamular notch is not very much defined and that might not uh, give you good retention of your processes so as you look at this picture so this is your custom tray or your special tray with which you will be doing your border molding so in this area the labial frenum has to be recorded so when you are placing green stick compound in the labial frenum area so you place it in the patient mouth you retract the upper lip of the patient upward outward and downward so upward outward and downward are the three uh, uh movements that you do for the upper lip to record the labial frenum area and so is that of your uh, the labial uh, the buccal frenum the labial edge the buccal edge and in the tuberosity area as i mentioned to you that the patient has to open his mouth and close his mouth so that is when the coronoid process comes in contact in this distal buccal flange area and it molds this particular area and regarding your posterior border that is your pps area uh, when you uh, ask the patient to do the valsalva maneuver that is when your pps area is recorded so please note and understand that pps a is a area and it is not a line in itself so that's with the maxillae so let's have a look at what 
uh, we have to remember and memorize and also uh, take note of in the mandible okay so as that of your maxillae in the mandible also you have supporting structures limiting structures and then your relief area so in your supporting structures you have residual alveolar ridge the buccal shelf area so this red color is denoting your residual alveolar ridge the yellow color is denoting your buccal shelf area then the retro uh, the limiting structures that is your retromolar pad area black color then buccal and labial frenum that is your uh, orange color lines in this area then you can see the lingual frenum then uh, then you see the uh, lighter green color that is your alveolingual sulcus then uh, in this area itself in the distolingual sulcus you see the retromylohyoid curtain and the masseteric notch. So once again to just uh, reiterate what, what are the different parts, the retromolar pad area, the floor of the mouth, the lingual frenum, then the lingual vestibule area, then uh, your buccal vestibule, this is your buccal shelf area, that's where your denture border should extend, you can see the labial frenum then your labial vestibule and the buccal frenum yeah and this pink color area is also your residual ridge so these are the uh, parts of your uh, and uh, parts of, or the main uh, anatomical landmarks of your mandible so and uh, the relief areas in your mandible are so the crest of the alveolar ridge then the mental foramen area the genial tubercles and the torus mandibular mandibularis so these are the four things that you will have to keep in mind that uh, they have to be given adequate relief so if there is no adequate relief given in all these areas what happens is the denture might put more uh, forces occlusal forces uh, on the residual ridge which might lead to rapid resorption so this rapid resorption will all uh, will always uh, lead to lesser denture uh, foundation area lesser uh, um, uh, uh, denture areas denture bearing area so hence leading to denture instability so uh, these are some of the uh, important landmarks. I'm sure you must be uh, very well uh, acquainted with all of this when you would have studied your anatomy. That is your uh, external oblique ridge and in the internal side you see the mylohyoid ridge as seen in the arrow marks. Then the mental foramen area uh, where it is supposed to be a relief area. Then uh, and yes looking at this picture in your patient mouth. So the labial vestibule, the external oblique ridge over here, the buccal shelf area, then your lingual vestibule, retromylohyoid fossa, then the mylohyoid ridge, premylohyoid fossa and retromolar pad area. So what has the buccal shelf area uh, supposed to be uh, looking like? So in this area, you can notice that this is your buccal shelf area. Uh, I hope the pointer is moving as I explained to you. So, so the area between the buccal frenum and the anterior edge of the masseter muscle. Medially, that so this particular area. So medially, it is the crest of the alveolar ridge and uh, laterally, it is the external oblique ridge that is uh, Ten, uh, that is the boundary of this particular area and distally it is your retromolar pad area so this region is supposed to be your primary stress bearing area in the mandibular arch next coming to the crest of the alveolar ridge in the crest of the alveolar ridge there is high rate of resorption so that is why we need to provide adequate relief because the, uh, and um, the underlying bone is usually cancellous bone and uh, so uh, apart from your spacer wax which is used for uh, providing space for the final impression material we we also use relief wax that is you're relieving those particular uh, anatomical landmark areas okay so if you uh, do not relieve those areas it might lead to uneventful resorption next coming to your mental foramen genial tubercles and the torus mandibularis so these are the three parts also supposed to be relieved uh, as mentioned earlier next coming to your 
limiting structures so the limiting structures as i mentioned they are supposed to be the borders of until where your denture can be extended without interfering with the normal functional movements so uh, here you can see that your labial frenum is present so this area has to be relieved in your denture then in the labial vestibule so that is where uh, till where your denture can be extended and uh, so uh, because uh, uh, this re this region usually the mentalis muscle is usually active uh, and and the the extent of the denture is uh, limited because of the muscle innervated closes so usually as the bone begins to resorb what happens is the mentalis muscle tends to come over the crest of the bone so that area also has to be uh, taken into note next coming to your buccal frenum areas just like your maxillae the buccal frenum area also connects as a continuous band and it uh, should be relieved as you see in this third picture that uh, that area has to be relieved so it's a small v-shaped notch or uh, which can be done with a straight fissure uh, burr and uh, coming to your uh, buccal vestibule area so as you see that uh, the buccal vestibule area also uh, is the area till where your denture can be uh, extended then your retromolar pad so your denture on the posterior uh, border should be covering the entire retromolar pad so that this uh, so, so when it is covered the bone uh, does not uh, resorb because of the pressure but you will you will always have to take an account uh, whether you want to place teeth on this particular area uh, or uh, distally or you're going to uh, stop uh, just before the retromolar pad area retromolar pad area is usually uh, like an moreover like an inclined plane so you usually tend uh, not to place uh, not to uh, place the uh, teeth on that particular area so next coming to your uh, uh, retromolar papillae so this is also a spear shape a small pear shape papilla area just uh, anterior to the retromolar pad area and uh, usually it is formed after the extraction of your uh, aids or your third molars and uh, denture should extend at the uh, distal end of the papillae so it uh, to cut it will not cover the entire retromolar pad area but it will just go to the, the but the distal end of the retromolar papillae is covered okay retromolar pad and retromolar papillae are two different uh, entities yeah and next coming to your retromyelohyoid uh, fossa it lies in the distal end of the alveolar lingual sulcus and posterior to the myelohyoid muscle seen in the picture next coming to your lingual frenum so the lingual frenum also has to be uh, relieved because when the patient tends to make lingual sounds or when the tongue comes in contact with the palate while speaking what happens is this lingual frenum when it is not uh, relieved it will lift up the entire denture and so the uh, the uh, the lower the mandibular denture will be out of its place and it will not be sitting on the denture foundation area so this area also has to be uh, relieved okay and then coming to your alveolar lingual sulcus that is your space between this residual ridge and the tongue so this area is called as your alveolar lingual sulcus that area uh, you have to determine the extent till which the denture will be extended okay so then coming to your alveolar lingual sulcus usually it's a reverse s or a typical s shaped uh, 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 kind of a molding that you can see these are typical impressions you can see that in this particular area so when uh, you ask the patient to move his tongue to the right or to the left lateral position what happens is in the alveolar lingual sulcus area the green stick compound is molded in a nice s shape pattern so when you see such kind of s shape pattern this can all uh, can be only seen in uh, very less or very uh, moderately resorbed cases in very highly resorbed cases you might not be able to visualize a, a typical s shaped alveolar Ling alveolar lingual sulcus then coming to your retromyelohyoid space so as uh, seen in the picture in the green area where the dist uh, where your arrow marks are so that is where your retromyelohyoid space is uh, there this area has to be recorded so that your denture will be extended into that area and it will also have uh, denture stability without dislodging while the patient is speaking or making any right left movement 
then coming to your masseteric groove uh, that is uh, determining the distal most uh, area of the denture and the denture should be contoured in this particular area so that the uh, the the buccinator muscle will be able to uh, uh, to be a, uh, able to exhibit its motion or its action in this particular area so that if this if this masseteric groove is covered or completely covered by the denture what happens is it interferes with the buccinator and this tends to lift up the denture when the patient is speaking so if the if the patient is coming and complaining saying that the denture is lifting up in this particular area it means to say that your denture has impinged into the masseteric groove area and if it is not uh, relieved it might cause soreness of that particular area so uh, in uh, an amain mandibular ridge the ideal mandibular ridge should have a well defined retromolar pad area uh, then it should have a blunt mylohyoid ridge deep retromylohyoid space then low frenal attachments and without any undercuts undercuts can uh, sometimes can be uh, favorable undercuts or unfavorable undercuts so it all depends from uh, 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 you know the kind of foundation that you have certain amount of uh, certain degree of undercuts in the mandible is definitely uh, good and it enhances the retention of the uh, uh, denture so it should not be uh, it, it it will not be a, having a negative uh, effect but sometimes what happens is when the undercut is too deep uh, the your cast tends to break or when your uh, uh, denture material flows in that particular area every time the denture is being taken in and out of the mouth what happens is it causes soreness in that area and as that of the maxillae you should also have abundant attached keratinized mucosa so in conclusion i would say that uh, uh, all the supporting structures the limiting structures the relief areas all these three particular uh, categories of the maxillae and the mandible have to be uh, treated with utmost care because in a very famous uh, our very famous uh, uh, stalwart in dentistry muller divan he said that the preservation of what uh, remains is of utmost importance and and all, and it is not about the meticulous replacement of what has been lost so you are uh, not on as a uh, dentist you are not only looking at uh, uh, you know replacement of what is lost but you should also be able to uh, preserve the uh, bone or the supporting structures that are already present okay i hope that in my lecture uh, everything has been explained to you clearly and if there is anything that i have missed please uh, feel free to comment uh, uh, on the lecture so that we can have a discussion and shortly uh, we will be opening up um, uh, your uh, uh, assignments also so please uh, do part uh, kindly participate in the assignments actively and revert back to us if you have any doubts and uh, we would also like to post any uh, videos that uh, might help you in uh, uh, educating uh, yourself and uh, i hope that you keep yourself safe during this period and until we meet again uh, goodbye and thank you